after our last meeting that if lunch is served at the moment of, of the middle of the board, we immediately say, success, uh, uh, what's, what's the right word, stop the discussions, whatever, and, and go out and eat and then come back in. So, you know, we'll bring that up at the policy board because that was rough, but you did a great job, Adam. Anyway, let me uh, just jump right into it. First off, we have our first agenda item is the approval of the agenda. Um, you've got them in your briefing package. Does anybody have any additions or changes to the agenda? Seeing none, we'll adopt those by consensus. Second is the approval of the proceedings from February 2017. Are there any changes or modifications to the proceedings? Seeing none, we'll adopt those by consensus. Uh, before each meeting, we have the opportunity for public comment for issues not on the agenda. I did not see anyone sign up for this part of it, but is there any public comment on issues not on the agenda? Oh, sorry, Des. Okay. Uh, you can grab a mic right there, Des. Any, any open one is fine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is Desmond Khan. For you who do not know me, um, my background is I have a PhD in population ecology and I have 25 years experience in stock assessment and marine fisheries management. Uh, I was on the striped bass technical committees for about 15 years or so. Um, I just have some sort of broad comments at this point on the overall direction of striped bass management. Um, I'm currently thinking of, of fisheries management as a balance between two goals. One is conservation, the other is utilization. And I think, you know, we need both, in my opinion. In my opinion, striped bass management currently lacks balance. It is tilted very far toward the conservation end, and it is denying people the utilization of this resource. And there's some trade-offs that occur when that happens that I'd just like to briefly outline for you. Um, one thing that, that causes this is the current reference points. I, I'm very aware that the 1995 uh, biomass level is the current overfishing threshold now, I know and you know there's no scientific basis for that choice. It was just something that the board, as I remember, said they liked that biomass level. That was the level that this, they declared the stock restored. So that's going to be our overfishing threshold. We're not going to let the stock fall below that. Uh, but that's not a you know, scientific choice. Um, then the, the target is so high that it's really in the realm of the carrying capacity of the stock. And if I would like to request that the board uh, ask the technical committee to develop a set of reference points based on maximum sustainable yield, which is the Bagus and Stevens standard and the, the, what the federal fisheries use for their management. Now, I'm not saying that should be the automatically the reference points for this this management process, but I think it would be something that would give you a valuable perspective on your current reference points, which are extremely conservative. Uh, I have seen a maximum sustainable yield modeling approach, surplus production modeling uh, of the striped bass stock, and what it found was that the biomass that would produce maximum sustainable yield. Now that is, in many of the federal fisheries, that is the target. The biomass that would produce maximum sustainable yield is below the current overfishing threshold for striped bass. That's how high the reference points are. Now, if you remember, under the usual federal system, they frequently will set the overfish. Des, we, we were actually going to be talking about this during the uh, later on for some of the later on discussion. So um, this is stuff we're really not on the agenda. Excuse me. Okay, uh, I wasn't sure about that. What your discussion was going to 
involved. Okay. Um, well, let me just let me just talk about the conservative nature real quickly. Okay. And the trade-offs for that are two that I want to. One is when we have a very high density. This is known from ecology. We will get negative feedback, density-dependent mortality due to intraspecific competition. That has been documented extensively in the Chesapeake Bay. There's been a great waste of striped bass due to very high mortality due to disease and starvation. This has been published in scientific papers. I'm not sure the management board realizes that by setting the biomass target so high, they've caused that waste and mortality. And second off, the impact of a very high abundance of very large fish on other species is well documented, although the boards don't seem to have seen this information, and I'm talking about particularly American shad and river herring. Uh, in the Delaware River, the, the, the spawning stock is negatively correlated with the abundance of striped bass. So that, that tells me, and there's extensive dive studies in the Ches uh, Connecticut River that striped bass are eating even adult male shad, and they definitely eat the juveniles. Uh, so there's a lot of published information indicating striped bass predation is depressing the abundance of shad and river herring Now, at these high levels. Now, on the one hand, you're wearing a hat of a striped bass manager, and on the other, many of you are on the shad and river herring board, and what you're doing is you're working across purposes. I'm not sure you're even aware of this or have been informed of this, and I would like to request some investigation uh, of these, these, these issues. Thank you very much. Thanks, Des. Um, I have two others for comments, but I, I understand they're going to be reserved to later on if we get into motion. So unless there's anyone else that has a public comment on things not on the agenda, we're going to move on. Okay. Uh, next agenda item is uh, considered draft addendum uh, five for public comment. Um, we, uh, as you are all aware, that we have a uh, uh, an addendum before us that was essentially uh, brought up by the Chesapeake Bay states for consideration of maybe some liberalization, and uh, Max is going to lead us through that discussion. Max. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so, yeah, today I'm going to walk the board through draft addendum five. The proposed options themselves are relatively simple, but there is a lot of important background information I need to get through, so, so bear with me. Um, and at the end, I'll take any questions on the document before Nicole, our TC chair, takes us through the TC's comments on those options. So uh, a look at the timeline. Today, the board will consider approval of draft addendum five for public comment. Uh, if approved, the uh, public comment period will be May through July, and then in August, the board will review public comment, um, select final options, and take final action on the addendum. So this is a look at the outline of the document. We have a statement of the problem. There's an overview of management history, stock status, fishery status. There's a section on the performance of addendum four which bleeds into the management options and then wraps up with the compliance schedule. So draft addendum five was initiated to consider a relaxation of the coastwide commercial and recreational regulations to bring fishing mortality to the target level based on the 2016 stock assessment update. And this action came in response to uh, concerns raised by Chesapeake Bay jurisdictions regarding the continued economic hardship endured by its stakeholders since the implementation of Addendum 4, but also uh, following information coming from the 2016 stock assessment update indicating that fishing mortality in 2015 was below the target. Uh, you'll also see throughout my presentation Chesapeake Bay abbreviated as C Bay. So I just uh, want to let folks know that that's what that stands for. Okay, so as we know, Atlantic striped bass has a very impressive management history. And in the interest of time, I'm just going to highlight those management documents and decisions most relevant to this draft addendum. So with the implementation of Amendment 4 in 1990, 
the foundation of this management plan has been to maintain fishing mortality at or below AF target. Currently, Atlantic striped bass is managed under Amendment 6 and its addenda 1 through 4. Aside from phasing in new commercial and recreational regulations, Amendment 6 also modified the F reference points. The coast operated under a single set of F reference points while the Chesapeake Bay and uh, other producer areas operated under a lower F target. Amendment 6 also put in place a new set of biological reference points based on the 1995 estimate of female spawning stock biomass. In addition to all this, Amendment 6 put in a set of management triggers that are based on those biological reference points. So fast forwarding to Addendum 4, which was implemented just prior to the 2015 fishing season. Uh, a lot of things happened with Addendum 4, uh, one of which is that it implemented a single set of F reference points for all areas. So now the, the coast, the Chesapeake Bay, all the other producer areas operate under a single set of F reference points. And additionally, the addendum required a reduction in removals to reduce fishing mortality to a level at or below this new target. To achieve this, fisheries implemented regulations to reduce removals by 25% along the coast relative to 2013 and 20.5% in the Chesapeake Bay relative to 2012. This is a quick reference of those addendum four measures. I'm not gonna waste time on this slide now. I'll come back to this in a little more detail when we go over the proposed management options. So this is a figure of spawning stock biomass relative to its reference points. And what you can see here is a decline in SSB that has been observed since about 2003. And in 2015 was estimated at 58,853 metric tons, which is just above the threshold of 57,626 metric tons. And I would like to remind the board at this point that if biomass falls below the threshold, it will trigger management action requiring the board to adjust the program to rebuild biomass to the target. So this is a figure of fishing mortality relative to those reference points. Uh, you can see F reaching a peak around 2006 and then uh, becoming somewhat variable since then. In 2015, F was estimated at 0.16, which is below the threshold and below the target, the threshold being 0.22, the target is 0.18. Uh, however, the TC has noted that the assessment may not be able to distinguish between point estimates of 0.16 and 0.18, essentially that the confidence intervals around these two point estimates would overlap. Okay, moving on to fishery status, so starting with the commercial sector. From 2003 to 2014, under the Amendment 6 quota system, commercial harvest has been relatively stable. Coastal fishery harvest estimates have ranged from 2.4 to 3.1 million pounds over that time period, and Chesapeake Bay estimates have ranged from 3.3 to 4.4 million pounds. In 2015, Following the implementation of the Addendum 4 regulation, so uh, cutting back on the quotas, the coastal fisheries harvested an estimated 1.9 million pounds and the Chesapeake Bay, 2.9 million pounds. Uh, just a couple more points on the commercial sector. First off, commercial debt discards continues to be a source of uncertainty in stock assessment. Estimates do vary considerably from year to year, which has uh, made it difficult to account for these when developing alternative management measures. In any event, in 2015, uh, commercial debt discards were estimated at just shy of 300,000 fish, which is a 68% decrease from the 2014 estimate, so a pretty big difference there. Another point is that the coastal commercial fishery underachieves its quota by 20% annually. 
Uh, some of that can be attributed to striped bass being designated as game fish in some states, so those being Maine, New Hampshire, Connecticut, and New Jersey. Collectively, those states account for 9% of the annual quota. But in addition, in recent years, striped bass have uh, not been available to the ocean fisheries in North Carolina, resulting in minimal harvest there. And I, I think that North Carolina holds 10 or more percent of the annual quota. Moving on to the recreational sector from 2003 to 2014, again, under the Amendment 6 regulations, harvest has been somewhat variable, but it, it has been trending down since about 2006. Um, coastal fishery harvest estimates have ranged from 16.7 to 26.6 million pounds. Uh, with 77% of that coming from Massachusetts, New York, and New Jersey. And then Chesapeake Bay harvest estimates ranging between 2.5 to 6.4 annually. In 2015, following implementation of Addendum 4, again, uh, harvest reductions measures were put in place. Coastal fisheries harvesting 13.3 million pounds in 2015, and Chesapeake Bay 3.5 million pounds. From 2003 to 2008, recreational releases averaged 17 million pounds, I'm sorry, million fish. That equates to roughly 1.5 million dead discards annually. Now from 2009 to 2015, that number of fish released has been much lower, averaging only 7.1 million fish which equates to uh, just shy of 640,000 dead discards a year. Uh, there's a couple theories out there as to why we're seeing this de decline in fish released. Um, this list is by no means inclusive. There's certainly other factors that are probably at play. Um, but just to, to list off a couple, reduced biomass or abundance. Uh, it could be the reduced availability of fish in nearshore waters, or simply just changes in angler behavior due to management changes. So building on the last few slides, I uh, just want to take a look at what happened in 2015 under Addendum 4. Um, so in early 2015, after states had implemented those measures to comply with Addendum 4, the TC predicted an overall reduction of 25% relative to the reference periods. Um, in 2015, what we saw was something very close to that predicted on a coast-wide scale. I think it was off by maybe a tenth of a, tenth of a percentage point. Um, however, harvest from the recreational fisheries in the bay and along the coast diverged significantly from that predicted value. So the TC was tasked to investigate this a little bit further, and what they concluded is that changes in effort, changes in the size and age structure of the population, and the distribution of the 2011 year class were the most significant variables contributing to that large difference between the observed harvest and that predicted by the technical committee. A couple more points on this 2011 year class. So remember that this was the largest recruitment event since 2004, and uh, the TC noted, looking at the catch data, that these fish were nearly fully available to the Chesapeake Bay fisheries in 2015, but only partially available to ocean fisheries. Due to this, the age at first migration, these fish are anticip anticipated to become increasingly available to coastal fisheries in the coming years, and a proportion of which are already of harvestable size. So after receiving this information, the board tasked the technical committee to calculate how many fish it would take to increase fishing mortality from that 2015 point estimate of 0 0.16 to the target 0 0.18 in 2017. And to do this, the TC ran projections through 2017 and determined that F target in 2017 equates to a removal estimate of roughly 3.3 million fish, or approximately 10% increase relative to 2015. So accordingly, draft addendum five proposes measures to increase removals 
So this is your commercial directed harvest, your recreational directed harvest, and dead discards by roughly 330,000 fish, which is a 10% increase relative to 2015. Um, keep in mind that the proposed options were developed using 2015 catch data and the plan development team focused on applying those increases to both the recreational, recreational and commercial fisheries equally. Also draft addendum 5 does not propose any changes to the commercial size limits or quota transfer provisions nor does it propose changes to North Carolina's FMP for the Albemarle Sound and Roanoke River. Okay. So these are the proposed uh, recreational options first. Option A here is status quo. Um, so for coastal fisheries, this maintains the addendum four measures with a one fish bag limit and a 28 inch minimum size limit and any approved conservation equivalency programs. For the Chesapeake Bay, Jurisdictions would implement a program that is subject to TC review and board approval, and that program has to meet the requirements of Addendum 4. So it's important to note that status quo has the potential to increase harvest by more than 10%. Coincidentally, MRIP came out with their final uh, 2016 estimates last night, and I was able to incorporate those into this PowerPoint. Um, so these numbers up on the screen are slightly different than are what in the draft document in front of you. Um, but in 2016, recreational removals, so this is your, your directed harvest plus your dead discards, are estimated at over 2.5 million fish, which is a 22% increase relative to 2015. Just talking recreational. Um, but this this difference is actually also greater than the 330,000 fish that the addendum is set out to achieve. So not only does status quo have the potential to increase recreational removals by more than 10%, but it also has the potential to increase total removals, commercial and recreational, by more than 10%. Option B for the recreational sector would be to relax recreational, recreational fishery regulations. So these options were developed based on 2015 catch data and 2015 state-specific regulations accounting for any conservation equivalency. So for option B1, states would maintain a one fish bag limit and reduce the minimum size limit to 27 inches. This represents a one inch decrease in the minimum size. And based on 2015 inform information, this would achieve roughly a 12% increase in removals relative to 2015. So by choosing B1, states would essentially implement those measures that were in place in 2015, including any conservation equivalency programs, and adjust the minimum size to 27 inches. Option B2 is a conservation equivalency type option where states would go through that process to implement a program that achieves a 10% increase relative to 2015. For the Chesapeake Bay, options B3 and B4 are very similar to the coastal option. Um, they were also developed based on 2015 catch data and 2015 state-specific regulations, including conservation equivalency that was in place. The difference here is that these measures would only apply to the specific dates listed. So both B3 and B4 maintain a two fish bag limit and decrease the minimum size to 19 inches from September 1st to October 31st for option B3 or during May 16 to August 31 under option B4. Also under both of these options, one of the two fish bag limit can be greater than 28 inches. So this represents a one inch decrease in the lower bound of that current slot limit. And also based on 2015 information, 
These options each achieve roughly a 9% increase in total Chesapeake Bay removals relative to 2015. Option B5 is again that conservation equivalency type measure type option where jurisdictions would go through the process to implement a program that achieves a 10% increase relative to 2015. Moving on to the commercial options. So again, option A is status quo. Uh, coastal fisheries would maintain that addendum for quota and the state specific allocations. Chesapeake Bay fisheries would uh, similarly maintain the addendum for quota of just over three million pounds. Option B is a 10% increase to the addendum for quota. So for coastal fisheries, the quota would be bumped up to a little over 3.1 million pounds and would be allocated uh, based on those same allocation percentages used in Amendment 6 and Addendum 4. And the Chesapeake Bay commercial quota would be bumped up to a little over 3.4 million pounds. So this is a table of the proposed quota options in pounds. Uh, I know the numbers might look small up on the screen there, um, but I'm going to walk you guys through this. So at the top, working top to bottom, we have the, the bay and coastal total quota numbers, and then followed by the state-specific coastal allocations, and then there's two rows at the bottom, which I'll, I'll get into. From left to right, we have 2015 harvest for reference. In the middle is option A, status quo, which is the addendum for quota. Option B applies a 10% increase to the addendum for quota. At the bottom, there's two rows, and in some of those cells, you see two numbers, a top number and then a bottom number in parentheses. So these are two different total estimated harvest scenarios. The top number assumes no harvest for Maine, New Hampshire, Connecticut, and New Jersey. These are your game fish states. And it also assumes no harvest for North Carolina, which we recall that North Carolina hasn't recorded any harvest in recent years. The bottom number in parentheses only assumes no harvest for the game fish states. So what this is saying is that under status quo, even after accounting for no harvest from those states, there is potential to increase harvest by 11 to 18 percent relative to 2015. Under option B, that potential increases to 22 to 30 percent. Also, these estimates do not account for commercial dead discards, which would add to that potential increase. The PDT also wanted to note that what you're not seeing is an option that applies a 10% increase to 2015 harvest, which is what the projections say is needed, but that would be an effective reduction in the coastal and state-specific quotas when the addendum aims to liberalize, so for that reason the PDT removed that potential option from consideration. Lastly, the, the compliance schedule. So this is something the board would need to decide on sometime between now and final action. If the addendum moves along, final action would take place in August, and presumably these three dates would occur sometime after that. Uh, just as a reminder, the projections only go through 2017, so the board should keep that in mind as it considers the compliance schedule. That's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, remember, Nicole is going to go over the TC's comments. Uh, but that's it for me. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Max. OK, I've got uh, Rob O'Reilly, Tom Fo Rob. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Max. And I'm wondering, with these projections of how much um, increase there could be, the 2011 year class, and I, I think it was in the document, part of the uh, management effort was to conserve the 2011 year class while it was in Chesapeake Bay. Um, are there any projections for 2017 and even 2018 with these uh, 2011 year class fish that are recruiting to the coastal fishery as to what that might be? Um, just a, maybe a 
Nothing like that. Okay. Uh, second. To correct note, there is. Sorry, to go back, there, the projections that were done included moving that 2011 year class forward through the population. So the reductions that we're seeing are take into account the fact that the 2011 year class will be recruiting to these fisheries and will be available for harvest um, overall. Right. Okay. So I may follow up, sir. So I'll follow up. Um, does that mean there's a probability associated with that as far as what that increase might be? or how does that work? So I'm just asking. Sure, so for the, the way we calculated the, um, the, the projections is essentially to, to move that population forward and to figure out if you fish at that, um, pro if you fish at that level, how much fish can you take? So if you fish at the target, how much fish can you take um, given the, the 2011 year class moving through the population? Um, and so there is a certain amount of uncertainty associated with that, with the um, uncertainty coming from the assessment. Um, I don't have those numbers in front of me, but we could go back and look at um, how much uncertainty there is around that. Tom Foti. Could you put back the numbers of the commercial harvest back up again? I noticed on this table you project that New Jersey will not catch any fish. Now, we're not catching a lot. I think it's about 10% of our quota, but we do have the, the tagging program, the bonus tag program, which basically is fish that come out of that, that number there. So it's not a zero harvest. There is a harvest of fish. It's a very small amount. I think it's about 8% or 10% of what our quota is, but there is a harvest. Yeah, I think it was the, the PDT's understanding that those fish that are caught in that bonus program actually are modeled recreationally, so. That's not true. They are modeled in with the uh, commercial catch because it goes against the commercial catch quota. That's where the program is set up, it's set up by legislation. And that's why we always keep it that way. It's a different quota altogether. My, okay, so this, these percentages would go up slightly more. Slightly more, not dramatically, because we don't harvest a, a large. Percentage. Yeah, I think it's somewhere around fifteen to twenty thousand fish. That's right. Yeah, yeah. which is less than eight percent or something like that. Yeah, but it's there, and we want to make sure it's always there. Okay, Tom. Thanks, uh, John McMurray. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Rob already asked part of my question, but but I guess I could go a little farther with those 2011s in the, the briefing material is pretty clear that they're going to recruit this year or next year, or, or a lot of them will recruit this year or next year. Uh, and, it, and I w wasn't quite sure what your answer was. Are, are we accounting for those in 2017 and 2018? Because given where we are now, uh, you know, we're already, just based on the two, six, 2016 numbers, we're already likely to be over, over or right around F target. Um, and I think, just intuitively, that, that the availability of those 2011s would probably put us way over and may even put us below that SSB threshold because we're already pretty close to that now. So the answer is they are accounted for in the projections, but they are not accounted for in the methods that we use to calculate how you get that increase. So the increases are based on looking at how the fishery was performing in 2015, and if you drop that size limit down, people can catch fish that they threw back. But we don't have a way to project that data forward to say in 2017 what percentage of the catch would be in that slot. But the, the projections to say you can catch this many fish and be at the target accounted for that 2011 year class moving in, but the methods to say you can reduce your size by one inch or you can go up um, in your bag limit, that does not take into account the, the effects of the 2011 year class, which is a source of uncertainty, and you can see how much it affected our reduction calculations. So we believe certainly, and I think that, I'm sorry, the TC comments, we'll get into this a little bit, but that is certainly a source of uncertainty in terms of calculating is this 10% on paper versus what we will see if this was implemented. Go ahead, John. Uh, thanks. So, so that sort of availability and, and angular behavior, and that, as somebody that does that's part of this business, I know. If the fish are around, people will, will target them. Um, 
that's that's really not taken into account in any of this right now. That's that's a big uncertainty area. Certainly in, in trying to calculate how much you'll see an increase or, or a decrease or a change in the harvest that you could see with these regulations, that is a very large source of uncertainty. Okay. Richie White. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to understand the numbers you provided uh, in terms of uh, why we are here with this addendum. Um, the re I understand the reason being that a number of uh, charter boat fishermen in Chesapeake Bay are, you know, <clears throat> have been experiencing uh, a drop in their business. So to, so to understand, help me understand that, 2015 recreational anglers had a 58% increase in harvest from 2014. Is that, did I hear that correctly and, or see that correctly? Uh, so the, the percentage that you're thinking of is relative to 2012, which were the, the, the reference period for the addendum four measures. So they experienced a 50-something percent increase relative to 2012, which I think that number would be a lot lower if we looked at 2014. Follow-up? Um, okay, so from 2012, they had a 58 percent increase. Then in the preliminary 2016 numbers are 22 percent increase over 2015. Is that correct? Yes, and that's, that's total recreational harvest and debt, debt discards. So total recreational removals uh, in 2016 is 22% higher than what it was in 2015. Additional follow-up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Rich. Thank you. And then this addendum would apply, would, would account for an additional 9% uh, increase, which if I total those up, that's an 89% increase of recreational harvest since 2012 and to me it seems like the, the, I'm not disputing that there aren't some charter boat captains that are experiencing some difficulty but the recreational angling population in the bay seems to be doing extremely well I, I know we would love to see numbers like that along the coast thank you okay um, John Clark thank you mr. chair Thank you for the presentation. It's good to see the stock is increasing as it was projected to do even before we took the 25% decrease in our harvest with addendum four. Um, I just wanted to uh, make a comment on the socioeconomic impacts part of this addendum. Uh, I'm glad to see it's in there, but I think it's uh, pretty thin considering I know just from Delaware, our netters have given up over a half million dollars over the past three years by having 25% less harvest. We took this cut back on a stock that was not overfished. Overfishing was not occurring, even when we put these much more conservative reference points in. And uh, I find the last line of this socioeconomic impacts section particularly gratuitous in that it and on, on an increasing stock, it says we have to be aware of the uncertainty in these projections. Well, there's nothing uncertain about the economic hit that netters in Delaware have taken and the Chesapeake charter fishermen that have been here for the last three, four meetings we've had here. I don't think they're here just because they want a few extra bucks. They're here because they see a real threat to their business. And I think this addendum at least gets us on the right track to correcting a uh, real over, over action that we took a few years ago. Thank you. Thanks, John. Mike Louisi. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to make a comment regarding uh, Richie's comment and just to, just to provide a little clarification. So the 2012 estimate in Chesapeake Bay was, I believe, to be the lowest recreational estimate in a very long time series and so it became the baseline for which we were judged and the year before that estimate came out the 2011 year class was born and so by the time the 2011 year class became recruited to to the fishery we were being judged based on addendum four um, as it related to a very low recreational harvest estimate in Chesapeake Bay that year 
and therefore what I'm saying, I, the 58% increase is, a, is an inflated value based on the, the comparison of those two years. So I think that that, and, and these, aren't all, these aren't new issues. We've discussed these uh, to this point today, and I'll just add one more comment that all of the background materials, which Max, you did a great job getting it all, bringing it all together, getting all the background materials in place. Um, there was a comment early on that this was a Chesapeake Bay issue. Well, it's not a Chesapeake Bay issue. We, this, is a coast, this is a coastal allowance for increase, which has been supported for the past year and a half by a majority of this board to get to the point we are today. So I just want to clarify for the record to the audience and the members of the board that this is not just a Chesapeake Bay thing. We're not looking to just catch as many fish as we can um, with, the, with this addendum. But I thank you for allowing me to clarify that, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Mike. Okay, I think we're going to go to the TC report now. Uh, Nicole? Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Nicole Engel. I work for the Rhode Island Department of Environmental Management. So Max already hit on some of these, um, and we've had some brief discussion on some of these as well. But today I'm going to be presenting comments from the Technical Committee on the proposed options in Draft Addendum 5 to Amendment 6. And again, um, some of this will be overlapped, so I'll try to be quick for time as well. So here's just a list of topics uh, that the TC had comments on, but in particular the TC population projections, preliminary 2016 removals, and as Max just said, we have the final estimates now available, discard data sources, the 2011 year class, angler behavior, and performance of addendum four. So I'm going to hit on the comments that the TC had on each one of these topics. The TC presented the board with population projections at their February 2017 meeting, which showed that an approximate 10% increase in removals from 2015 levels would increase F to the target of 0.18 in 2017. However, management options adopted by the board through draft addendum 5 will most likely not be implemented until late 2017, early 2018, adding an additional year of uncertainty. Regarding the preliminary 2016 removals, the 2016 stock assessment update and the TC population projections use data through 2015 only. The preliminary 2016 removals were estimated to be approximately 18% greater than 2015 removals under addendum four with no additional changes. And as Max just noted, the final estimates that came out showed that was more closely 22%, not 18%. Discard data was an important data element that went into the options presented in draft addendum 5. These data came from the American Littoral Society, or ALS fish tagging program, and the EMRIT program. These data sources can be variable year to year regarding the number of fish tagged and the level of sampling, and there's also been recent changes in EMRIP methodology that the TC just wanted the board to be aware of. We've already touched on the 2011 year class a little bit, but we all know it's had a strong presence in the Chesapeake Bay in recent years. A larger proportion is expected to migrate to the coastal fishery in 2017 and in 2018. This will result in changes in catch, harvest, and dead discards on the coast and in the Chesapeake Bay, which are not accounted for in draft addendum four options. Sorry, draft addendum five options. Angler behavior can be quite variable from year to year and with changing regulations, and it cannot be accounted for and therefore was not considered in draft addendum five. When the TC evaluated the performance of addendum four, we found that on a coastwide scale, the 2015 harvest estimate was very close to the predicted harvest. For, recreational, for the recreational fishery on the coast and in the Chesapeake Bay, harvest estimates differed significantly from those predicted. Recreational fisheries in the ocean saw a greater reduction than that was predicted, and recreational fisheries in the Chesapeake Bay experienced an increase in harvest relative to the reference period. 
The most significant variables found to contribute to these large differences were changes in effort, changes in the size, age structure, and distribution of the 2011 year class along the coast relative to the Chesapeake Bay. The proposed options in draft addendum 5 make very similar assumptions to those used in developing addendum 4. The estimated increases, therefore, could be significantly under or over predicting harvest. And that's it, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Questions for Nicole? Richie White? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, does the technical committee have any concern um, over coastal fishery harvesting 27-inch striped bass? Because uh, we've always uh, operated under uh, 28 inches, uh, kind of being a minimum level in that. I think it's 60 some percent of 28 inch fish of bread. Um, so does this raise a, a higher risk uh, if the coast starts uh, harvesting a large number of 27 inchers that uh, seem to be uh, available in the 2011 year class this year and next year? So the technical committee didn't specifically talk about what biological implications could occur from reducing the minimum size. That happened to be one of the only options that came close to that 10 percent. John McMurray. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think there's a lot of confusion about what size those, two, those 2011s that are flooding the coast this year are. Are they 24 inches or are they 28 inches? I know there's some variability there, uh, but it really makes a difference in the context of this addendum because if we go down to 27 inches, and, and really anecdotally, that's what I'm seeing now, a lot of 27 and 28 inch fish. If we go down to that 27 inches, we're really gonna pound that 2011 year class as it floods the coast. And I think to some extent, we're already seeing that this year uh, and, and one inch probably does make a difference. But, but anyway, back to my question, what, what size are those 2011s? What, what's the range? So it's a little hard to give you a specific size. The age length keys can vary not only regionally on the coast and then the Chesapeake Bay, but also state to state and year to year. So we know that they have recruited partially to the coastal fishery and they're going to continue to do so in the next couple of years. An approximate guess without looking at the data, 25 to 30 inches right now, there's gonna be a proportion that falls in one of those inch length bins. But it does vary quite a bit. Other questions for Nicole? Okay, seeing, oh, oh, go ahead, Michelle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I don't know if this is for Nicole or for Max, but the 2016 harvest estimates, were you able to break those down into coastal harvest versus bay harvest? Yes, um, <laughs> I don't have it at my fingertips right now, and I can get those to the board as soon as possible. Any other questions before we start getting into motions? Uh, Michelle? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just one more question. So the, the calculated 10% liberalization of the 327,000 fish, so that is, that's just broadly calculated across um, all fleets. So that applies to both the, the coastal fleet, the bay fleet. It, it's not it's not taking into account, I guess, the different, um, the different size limits that are in those different jurisdictions. It's just sort of a quote unquote standard striped bass is, so, standard size striped bass is how those 327,000 fish were calculated. Is that correct? 
the selectivity function of the separate fleets and weighted by how much each fleet takes out was included in that effect. So it does take into effect some of the, the different effects of the fishing fleet. Uh, so you were asking for the 2016 numbers in the bay versus the coast. Uh, it's 1.18 million. Fi is that fish? Fish uh, for the bay, and 1.38 million for the coast. Any other questions, Lauren? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for the report that relates to the relative abundance uh, uh, of striped bass for uh, legal uh, fishing. Do we have any uh, updated information regarding illegal uh, take of fish and uh, the impact on, uh, on the uh, species? Thank you. So I, I don't have like a, a great uh, number to give you or, or anything like that. Um, there's definitely some information that comes in our compliance reports for last year. The, the reports covering the 2016 season aren't due until a little later this month. Um, our LEC uh, chair to the, uh, to the striped bass board is in the other room right now. Hopefully uh, if he becomes available we might be get you some more insight on that. Thanks, Mike. So any, any other questions? Okay, this is an up. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick question. Um, the term angler behavior was used, and it was stated that it's, it varies, and it wasn't accounted for. Could you just elaborate on what you meant by angler behavior and what that means? Thank you. Sure, so angler behavior is the behavior of an individual fisherman. How many trips they're going out for, is it worthwhile for them to go out and target two fish versus one fish? They have to account for their time, the money they're spending on gear, on fuel. So changes like that are not accounted for in any of these options and it's very difficult to account for those. It's more socioeconomics. Does that answer your question? Thanks, Annie. Uh, Rob O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess I just wanted to ask uh, the technical committee uh, the idea of everything being in pounds. So fishing mortality rates are calculated based on numbers usually. Is there any similarity here with the pounds? In other words, how did you back everything out to pounds of, as the currency instead of numbers? How does that work? So you, you, you make a good point, and thanks for that question. Um, the removals are estimated, and fish mortality, I believe, it's estimated in numbers of fish. Um, the recreational options that you saw in, in C are based on number of fish. The quota options for the commercial sector are in pounds, and there is a disconnect, you know, when we talk about a, a total number of fish that we can remove to, to achieve F-target and using one currency for the, quote, for the commercial quotas and a separate one for the recreational fisheries. We, we thought about a lot of different ways to address that, um, but the more we got into the weeds, it, it became more and more complex and confusing to to try to estimate numbers of fish from the commercial sector. So to keep things simple and the way that it was done for Addendum 4 as well, uh, this is the approach that the plan development team took with those two sectors. Any other questions? Okay, um, this is an action item. So if we're gonna move this along, we're gonna need to get a, a motion up on the board, John Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to move that the board uh, approve draft addendum five for public comment. Thank you. Motion by John Clark and second by Mike Louisi. Discussion on the motion? Go ahead, John. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, as stated, I think the 
as was seen by Delaware's action in appealing Addendum 4. This 25% reduction in harvest, well, I understand why it was taken. I uh, understand your perspective on the st status of the striped bass stock. depends on where you are on the coast, but we've seen the stock do what it was expected to do. It has definitely increased. Um, our fishing public has taken a big reduction in this, and the stock is showing all the signs of recovery that we expected, and I would hope that at this point the board can start giving some of that reduction in harvest back to the to the public. Thank you. Michael Louisi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so unlike the the last two addendum addenda that we discussed this week uh, with lobster and then tautog, this one's relatively simple as far as what the main issue is, and that main issue is whether or not to allow for the t a 10 percent liberalization in harvest coastwide, both commercial and recreationally. Um, I've had a couple tacos, and I've, dr I've had about 15 cups of coffee today, so if we need to go back into all the details in the background information of the document, let's do it. It's not the first time we've had to do that, but I, I think at, at, this, uh, at this point in time, I don't need to talk anymore, and we need to give the public an opportunity to weigh in on these issues. Um, we, just, we heard based on the, uh, on the report that the 2016 final estimates were made available yesterday, and so I think that that's coming into play here as far as what board members are thinking about and how this is going to move forward. But let's, give, let's, let's let the, the process complete itself. Uh, the board initiated this addendum, the issues brought up regarding variability and uncertainty, um, the issues brought up about harvest as compared to Addendum 4 in, in current years has been discussed, but the Board approved the initiation of this addendum, and I, and, I, and I know for certain that my public stakeholders in Maryland want the opportunity to weigh in on this. And once we have all of that information, once we have the technical evaluation, the public's uh, comment, both in opposition and in support, um, I think as a board we have all the ingredients we need to make a final decision in August, so I would hope that um, other board members will also support taking this out to the public. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Richie White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I'm not going to support this motion. Um, I think it is risky uh, on a number of levels. I think there's not enough room in, in the mortality to implement this. I think it's uh, a knee-jerk in that we got a 2018 stock assessment, so this could be one year, and then we'll have to go, we'll probably have to go into uh, a management measure in reaction to the stock assessment. Um, there's a lot of unknowns. I think there clearly uh, going to be a change in uh, anglers along the coast with the 2011 year class being available this year. There's going to be a lot of 27, 28 inch fish, uh, as John has mentioned that he's, he's presently seeing. And I think that's going to increase mortality substantially along the coast. Um, I think that it makes no sense to, to take this risk at this time uh, for one year uh, and put the technical committee and the commission through the expense and the effort that it takes to go out the public hearing. I think we all know, I don't think there's anybody at this table that doesn't know what the results of the public comment's going to be. I'd be astounded if one person would raise their hand and say, gee, I don't know what, how the public's going to weigh in on this. We know what the public's going to say. So going through all that exercise, to me, is a waste of our resources. And I hope we vote this down. Thank you. Thanks, Richie. Uh, I got Mark Gibson next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm conflicted on this, this question. <clears throat> on, on the one hand, um, you know, we're a commission and we have an obligation to um, be sympathetic and responsive when members of the commission come forward with a perception of a problem in one of our FMPs. Um, and the Bay jurisdictions have made impassioned arguments about this. We've had people come to the, uh, the meetings and speak 
uh, in favor of this, this action. But I'm also a fan of the precautionary principle. Um, and the foundational element to that is that when you're when you have signs of a improvement, you're slow to open the valve. But when you have signs of a, a problem, you're quick to close the valve. That's the essential element of the precautionary principle. And unfortunately, I'm a fan of both principles, the cooperative and collaborative nature we're supposed to have here to be responsive to jurisdictions' needs, but also um, to deal with the uncertainty. And this stock is perilously, perilously close to the biomass threshold at this point. And I may have some issues uh, about the biomass threshold itself, and we'll talk more about that in the reference point. Um, but I'm uh, conflicted at this point. I'll leave it at that. <coughs> Well, yeah, you're going to have to get unconflicted because we're going to have to have a yes or a no. Anyway. John McMurray. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Probably not terribly surprising that I don't support the motion. Um, frankly, I think it's, it's reckless. Uh, there's very little biological justification for doing it. Uh, we are just a hair over that SSB threshold. And, uh, you know, sure, we had a couple of good young of the year indices. But when you look at that average over the last 10 years, it's not great because we also had two of the worst. Um, yeah, we're operating below F target based on the 2015 removals. But when you look at 2016, not so much. And when you project out to 2017 and 2018 and you consider those 2011s recruiting, it, it seems almost a certainty to me that we're going to go over that F target. And an increase you know, shouldn't be on the table at this point, in my opinion. Um, Frankly, uh, there has been some impact with Amendment 4, but I'm not, I'm not convinced that it's as catastrophic as, as it's being made out to be. When you look at the, the effort numbers in the Bay, they're up. Uh, I don't doubt that there's not some impact in some uh, regionally significant areas, but it's not broad and it's not catastrophic in my opinion. It's not worth the risk we'd be taking with this. Um, and, and lastly, there's the timing issue. Do we really want to go out to public comment for this, make all these guys to show, show up to public meetings, and inevitably the halls will be filled, at least where I am and, and to the north, the halls will be filled with, with angry surf casters not wanting to see this happen. Uh, we're going to have a new stock assessment in 2018, and we're likely going to have to do new management measures once we have the information from that, and, and the next year we're likely going to have to do this all over again. And that just doesn't really make sense to me. So, so for those reasons, I'm opposed. Thank you, John. Uh, Doug Grout. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have heard for uh, three or four meetings since uh, that we've had since uh, Addendum Four was put for um, the harsh uh, economic impacts that have the Maryland charter boat fleet and the Chesapeake Bay charter boat fleet, as well as other mid-Atlantic states, have, uh, businesses have been impacted. And I was sympathetic. We saw, um, uh, if you look at some of the, the, their harvest numbers, they were down in 2015 significantly, about 40 percent. But that's not the only places we saw this. We saw uh, reductions in New York that were over 50 percent. Uh, Massachusetts was over 50 percent. Um, and probably about a 40 percent reduction in Rhode Island. Um, now, as you would expect with a, a um, uh, management measure that uh, increased the size limit, that uh, in the Chesapeake Bay, the uh, reductions were temporary. If you look at what 2016 estimates, they're back up to the second highest uh, levels of estimate of harvest they've had since uh, in the past seven years. That didn't occur on the coast. In those three states, um, all Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and New York were a large portion of uh, these uh, charter boat harvest that takes place uh, continued in 2016 to see reductions. My concern here is if you remember the reason we 
if we were to move forward with this, um, if you remember the reasons that we took action uh, in 2014 with our addendum four, was because we were required to under our management plan. The trigger that was hit was number three, the fishing mortality target exceeded, is exceeded in two consecutive years and the female spawning stock biomass was also below the target at the time. And as a result, uh, our plan says the management board must adjust the striped bass management program to reduce the fishing mortality rate to a level that is below the target. Now, as you all know, we have a bunch of other triggers. My concern here is the technical committee has already set, indicated that just in 2016, we've already experienced a 22% increase. That's more than double uh, the 10% uh, buffer that we had in between there. And, you know, people talk about the uncertainty with uh, MRIP estimates. They are an estimate. They have variation around it. But they are, as they say, outside the, tech, outside of the confidence in, intervals here. So we are pushing forward without even this action. We are at risk of starting to exceed the target again. My fear is after we've taken these painful cuts coastwide, uh, and had them in place for at least three years, maybe a fourth by the time we get a, any kind of uh, management action, depending on what we see on our, our uh, stock assessment next year, then we're going to have to take additional cuts. And if we were to implement an additional 10 percent increase here, those cuts would be even more painful. Not to mention that our public would look at us and say, what are you doing? What are you doing here? You, you have scientific information that says you're approaching the target again, and yet you're trying to increase it even further. I think the commission has to take a long, hard uh, look at before we make any further uh, adjustments. We need to at least wait until we get the assessment and then make a rational decision as to whether we need to make any further management adjustments. I'm hoping when this assessment comes that we can go back to what the pre, uh, uh, the pre addendum four levels are because we've taken the pain for a few years and now we've got our, our uh, spawning stock biomass on the way up and we're continuing to keep our, our fishing mortality around the target. So thank you very much for, the, for my opportunity here. Thank you, Doug. Uh, Rob? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think one thing that should be obvious to everyone is there was a lot of talk about 2012 being a um, low point. And when you look through the data, it certainly is. But everyone should understand that since 2012, uh, the bay will be faced with those types of conditions again. So um, from now until the next few years, the 2011 year class, which did have conservation uh, attached to that year class in the bay management measures, um, that's not going to be available. So there should be empathy with the plight of the charter boat, head boats, um, going forward because we're going to return to that situation. Uh, we're going to return to somewhere near 2012. Um, it's not to say that the Chesapeake Bay, if you cobble together both the Virginia and the Maryland Young of the Year, that you can't come close to average or a little bit less in some of the years. So there's going to be some fish, but apparently over the years, um, you know, from 2007 forward, up until 2011, you can sort of trace what's happened to the stock. So I do want to remind everyone to think about what goes around with the bay is definitely going to turn um, starting in 2017. The other thing that's been interesting to me as I thought about it a lot the last few days is when Amendment 5 started, the work that was done in 1994, and Mark Gibson was one of the architects of the overall harvest control model, along with Lou Rugolo and Vic Greco. Um, at that time, there was a pretty equal distribution 
of harvest between the bay and the coastal fishery. It was set up that way to have somewhat of an equal distribution. It seems to me that in the intervening years, it's been sometimes not working out that way. Um, you know, feast or famine type of situation, depending on where you are. Even with the Amendment 6 process, if you remember, um, Amendment 6 was delayed because there was a hiccup in that there was a proposal to have everyone at 24 inches, which everyone thought would be great. We'll have one uniform size until it was pointed out that if that happens, you shift allocation. You know, you take exploitable stock biomass away from the bay. So I think you have to think about the differences uh, as well as the similarities when you look at striped bass management. But clearly, the most important thing is we can't solve some of these issues until we have a stock assessment. I understand that. I will have comments about that later. But for right now, consider not 2016. Start thinking about 2017, 18, and 19 and what it's going to be like in the Bay because you have the information before you that should tell you exactly how it's going to be. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Rob. Uh, Matt? Uh, thanks. Um, so I can certainly sympathize with the frustration that the bay anglers must have with so many fish you know, available to them that are below uh, the minimum size and the discard issue that that could create. Um, and that's why back in February I supported initiating the addendum because uh, it seemed fair to develop the analysis and uh, give an opportunity for this concept to be discussed at this meeting. But it seems that um, liberalization in management measures um, based on this very small difference between the 2015 F and the target F and for the other reasons that we've all talked about here, it just doesn't seem prudent to me um, to take this out at this time. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I have uh, Marty Geary. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, the Chesapeake for hire fleet's been brought up a few times, but it's not just them, it's our commercial sector as well. Um, you've noticed at several meetings in the past, I count three, that we had multiple bus loads for our for hire sector and other fishery constituents that have taken the time to come up to these meetings. Not that we haven't seen that in other areas up in New England and seen all the passion on both sides of this issue. Um, but I just wanted to say that they're not here today because they're in the throes of their most important part of their season right now, the opening of the str spring striped bass season. Their leadership is here today but I, I think I respectfully disagree with a couple of comments I heard that would be a waste of our resources to take this out to public comment. Those folks took a lot of their time over multiple iterations. You've seen them yourselves show up here, and their, their leaders are here. They may say something today, but I do think we owe it to the public, our fishing constituencies, and the constituencies up and down the coast to let this go out to public comment. So I appreciate that, and hope, hopefully folks can support that. Thank you. Thanks, Marty. Michelle? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll be brief. Um, you know, I, I'm not going to echo all the comments that I made at the last meeting with regard to, um, you know, my own conflicted views on this. I, I definitely am sympathetic to the unique nature of the bay fishery. We have the same thing with the Albemarle Roanoke stock in North Carolina, and I really do truly think that the only way to address these is through the upcoming stock assessment and looking at the reference points again um, and, and coming out with a solution that addresses that the unique characteristics of the bay fishery. Um, I am concerned about timing on this and uh, you know, we heard some public comment prior to the start of our deliberations today with regard to the reference points, which we will get into a discussion about next. But, you know, it's not 1995 anymore, and I think we would support a different approach. Thanks. Thanks, Michelle. Okay, I think I'm going to go to the public now. We had a couple of folks signed up for comments. So, um, Phil Langley, would you like to come up and make a comment? Good afternoon. My name's Phil Langley. I'm president of Maryland Charter Boat Association. 
I sit on the Potomac River Fisheries and Maryland Sport Fish Advisory. I'd like to thank you, Mr. Chair, for the op opportunity to make public comment, and I would like to thank the board as well. We are now entering our third year of addendum four reductions. And some of the things I was gonna speak of have already been said here today. So I'm gonna be kind of brief, but I can assure you that it is difficult to get charter boat captains to local meetings versus getting them to Alexandria for a public meeting. And if it had not been an issue of concern for these guys, they would have not made the trip. The most of the 2011 year class has now entered the coastal migration. The 2015 stock update assessment showed that we were fishing below the addendum four target. I'm here this afternoon, just I would like to ask the board to approve addendum four, I'm sorry, addendum five, for public comment and allow the process to continue. There are hundreds and thousands of individuals who would like the opportunity to comment, whether being for or whether being against addendum five. By not allowing this addendum to move forward for public comment, we are silencing the voices of many who would like the opportunity to comment on this subject. So that's all I have to say. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Langley. Uh, Robert Brown? Robert T. Brown, President of the Maryland Watermen's Association. I'd like to thank the Technical Committee for their work in preparing this data. And we're looking forward to having a com public comment period. Uh, we ran into problems when our benchmark was changed, when it was raised up a few years ago. It just threw us less than 1% out, and we ended up with a 25% reduction. There's one thing we have to remember. The Mother Nature is going to give us a balance that may not be what we desire for all fisheries in the bay. And uh, we need a multi-management plan also, because with these predators, these rockfish we have in the bay, it is more than our, our spot, which they eat on, which is plummeted down. Also, we have the, uh, our crabs, which have made a rebound, but I believe that has to do with the grasses. And I just want to uh, thank you all for letting me speak here today. And the reason that some of the watermen are not here today, if you all haven't noticed the last two weeks, the way the weather's been blowing so hard, they haven't been able to work. And I mean, in today's a, a finally a halfway decent day. And we all have to make a living. So hopefully you all will proceed forward with this public comment period. And just remember, We've got to protect more than just the rockfish. If we end up with nothing but rockfish in our Chesapeake Bay, our other fisheries are going to hurt. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Patrick? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Patrick Paquette, past president and current government affairs officer for the Massachusetts Striped Bass Association. Um, I also represent a coalition of, of angling groups um, from the Northeast regarding this subject. Uh, I just wanted to point out a couple of things that I didn't think were adequately covered during your, discu your discussion. One is that there was reference to the conservation measures that have already been taken toward the 2011 class in the Bay. Um, that is only partially true because according to the science, those measures, those reductions were not met. The reductions that were successful in the overall previous addendum were carried by the coastal fisheries and our reduction in, in our achieving and overachieving the cutbacks in our fisheries. But down in the bay, they did not meet the reduction that they were required to. So let's please remember that, that we've already paid for some of that and we don't want to pay for any more of it. We'd like it to be equal shared pain. And I think Mr. Grout got, uh, got along there, but the bay did not meet the reduction. Effort, the effort projection regarding 
um, this 2011 year class should not be blown away in the, project, in the projections. It was very clear from the TC that the increased effort that is guaranteed to happen with more availability along the coast is not projected. So as bad as the projection numbers look, it's going to be worse. That is clear to those of us that are in the fishery. Along the coast, we are going to catch more than is what is projected. Next, the 2011 year class, a, a fishery cannot be built and maintained on one single year class. And reports from Rhode Island and Massachusetts are a little bit concerning to me because there's a window of the way the migration reaches New England states. What happens is the really smaller fish tend to show up and then it's always normally three, four weeks until the first keeper. That's not what we have seen this year. And both the West Wall and the first keeper, the West Wall in Rhode Island being like sort of the traditional place that people monitor for when the fish show up in Rhode Island, the first keepers were reported at the saltwater edge in Narragansett exactly three days after the schoolies showed up. In Massachusetts, on Cape Cod, the first keepers were caught within two days. And worst of all, in Martha's Vineyard, which usually sees the smaller sublegal fish for a good six to eight weeks prior to the first keepers showing up, it was the same day that the fish arrived at all that the first keepers were caught. And what that tells me is that there's a big giant hole of years and a lot of small fish prior to the 2011 that aren't there. So the, the year classes after 2011 are not good. And the year classes before, we know that story because they triggered the last reduction. So to build a fishery on 2011 and not, to not be ultra conservative with it is just irresponsible in our opinion. Also, I would like those of you who love to look at the MRIP data to take a good long look because what is being reported about the Chesapeake Bay charter fishery is not matching what that fishery is saying on the internet, what their advertising and fish reports tools are saying, and the MRIP data is clear that catch and number of trips in that fishery are on the rise. Things are getting better there already without an action. An action is not required you should consider the next action after the next benchmark. Thank you. Thank you. Arnold Leo. Yes, thank you. Um, I am Arnold Leo, and I'm an um, element of the socioeconomic uh, sector of this uh, fishery. Um, I speak on uh, behalf of the uh, fishing industry of the town of East Hampton, and so we have uh, very significant commercial and uh, recreational uh, uh, elements in this uh, fishery. And um, it seems to me over the years, um, and I can't even remember how many decades I've been doing this, uh, with striped bass, that um, we're always uh, getting a reduction, um, which is um, very rarely leading to uh, a uh, increase when um, things begin to look better with the abundance of the uh, stock. And uh, it seems to me that there's at least enough evidence to uh, warrant allowing this to go out uh, for public uh, comment and uh, uh, allow yourselves to uh, uh, hear from the socioeconomic uh, element of the fishery. Thanks. Thank you, Arnold. Sir, in the back of the room. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Captain Robert Dumer. I'm chairman of Delmarva Fisheries Association. Um, we represent those on the Delmarva Peninsula, not only in the commercial entity, but also in the recreational and in the charter industry. One, one thing I want to uh, say, I've been doing in the charter business 35 years of my life, and on the Chesapeake Bay and in Massachusetts. I learned to fish in Massachusetts during the summers. 
what we're seeing in the Chesapeake, yeah, last year was probably the worst year that I had ever seen as far as catching of fish. I don't know where these numbers that, you know, I mean, granted they may be putting it on the internet, but the old saying is, believe none of what you read, half of what you see, and all of what you do. So in respect to my fellow fishermen from Massachusetts, I think that needs to be taken into consideration. But the fact is we had people traveling as far as 30 to 40 miles a day coming to the northern reaches of the bay to catch fish because when I moved my business down to the southern reaches of the bay eight years ago, three years ago, it took me 300 fish to catch to put a limit of 12 in my cooler because the fish were 18, 18 and a half, 19, 19 and a half. So by moving to the northern reaches of the bay, I alleviated that problem. Fortunately, I, you know, I have some property in the northern bay and I was eligible, you know, to do that. But this year specifically we're in, a, we're in a bad situation too i've run i've had to cancel the majority of my trips because of the availability of the spawning fish these fish spawned early as early as the end of february beginning of march i've run 12 trips and i've caught 18 fish a lot of my guys leave the harbor fish eight ten hours have maybe one pull down one fish it's not the fact that the fish are not there they spawned and they've gone but on the other hand dnr our department is seeing record numbers of of large spawning cows in the reaches of the susquehanna so i mean it's you know it's the fish are just not there they left we missed them and that's because of mother nature i think a lot of what we're seeing and these numbers of fish are where the fish are spawning, they're short spawning, they're going to different areas. I mean, it's like they say all the big fish leave the bay. Well, last summer there were a lot of large fish, just large fish were caught. There we do have a resident, you know, uh, school of large fish that maintain in the Chesapeake, but a lot do go up to the Massachusetts. Now I've talked to some people this week, for instance, on the headwaters of the, of the uh, Hudson River up at Lake Champlain, they're catching huge fish right now. Connecticut River, they're catching big fish. And, you know, are these, have these fish missed Maryland? No, most of them are heading up the coast. The surf people on the coast off of Ocean City are catching a lot of fish where, you know, they're three weeks, three weeks ahead right now. So, I mean, with this Addendum 5, I, I think, you know, I would, to bring, bring it to public comment, you know, fortunate I was able to come here today. A lot of my, I do have someone running my boat today because it's, this is a, a passion to me, but uh, to not have the public comment on this and not to adopt this addendum, I mean, you know, I see what the fishery does. I'm out there every day. Fortunately, a lot of the people in the room here are not able to do that. I'm seeing more rockfish than I have ever seen in my entire life in the bay right now. Little ones that are going to grow. I mean, I do refute some of the young of the year index and how they do that, but that's, you know, for another time, another date. But I would implore this board, you know, to and and not to offend anybody on here but i i, I kind of have a, a saying that i've earmarked it, that politicizing of a natural resource is the damnation of that resource i mean the technical group has done a very good job of presenting these issues and to throw personal agendas and politicism because i don't like this person i don't like that person this state doesn't like that state it, it's for the betterment of the fish and and that's what i think that you know we need to go for the forward with this public comment we need to address this because I, I just don't want to see us to get into a situation in the bay where we have a bio crash where we've missed something and all of a sudden bam all of a sudden more fish show up than we know what to do with and then you know bottom line the only one that suffers is the natural resource i thank you very much thank you sir okay i'm going to come back to the board um if any comments uh go ahead thank you mr chairman um maybe a kind of mixed bag between questions and comments but if i understand correctly we have the stock assessment that will be coming up in 2018 and then subsequent management measures might fall if anybody can help me what would be the earliest those might hit the ground or the water i should say so the uh, benchmark is scheduled to be completed at the end of 2018 uh, which i would leave the review of that the board review of that would be early 2019 which would be the earliest so february would probably be the earliest point uh, you could take action following the the assessment sure so so what we're looking at is is uh potentially two and a half three years before any assessment might change make an increase a decrease or any availability of harvest i think at this point you know i mean there may be a lot of mixed opinions as to about what the correct action is to go at this point but it seems to be obvious that this has impacted some folks and all they're asking us to do is consider it let us have some time to public comment on it let us get some more facts some more data 
nothing on this, if we made any decision and even approved it in August, would happen before 2018, before that stock assessment or benchmark stock assessment would occur, in which case I'm sure there's several safeties to say that, look, we put something in place, now we know it's a bad idea, we could, we could call it. Uh, it's just my opinion at this point. Now, granted, I have to discuss this further with my peers, but we're not taking any actions today. We're simply considering them for the future. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, Doug? Um, just to follow up on uh, David's comments, I, I just want to get clear here. If we followed the process on this addendum and went through the public uh, comment period and took action, that action would be uh, implemented in 2018 at the earliest. Is that? And if we waited for the stock assessment and took action, that would on, that would that could come in. That that whatever came out of that um, measures could be implemented in 2019. So we're looking at back to Richie's comment. Is it, it's a one-year difference I, that there would be between waiting for the stock assessment and 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 doing action from that or going through this process. Am I clear on that? I yeah, that's roughly, yeah, give or take a few months, yes. John Clark. I just have to question that timeline, Mr. Chairman. If the assessment isn't released to the board until late 2018, there's no way we're going to have a, a the uh, assessment and a new addendum approved in 2019 for action in 2019. It'll be 2020 at the earliest before there are any actions taken on the benchmark assessment. Yeah, John, I, uh, again, that's, you know, depending upon how fast the board can move, but you're probably right. It's, it would probably take us that long. Mike? And I'll just, I'll agree with John. We started this action back at the annual meeting in Florida, which was about 18 months ago. So that's how long it's taken us to do an assessment update and consider the information and draft an addendum. So I just want to make sure it's clear that I, I doubt that 2019 will be the first time that we'd be able to take action. Okay. Um, all right, Marty, get the last shot, and then we're going to caucus. Just quick clarification. The Addendum 5, if it were to pass, would be possible for that to be implemented in fall of 17? If the board took final action in August and states could go through their processes, then yes. But if, if not, I think m many states need some time with that as well. Uh, so it could be as early as you know, January 2018. Okay, I understand, and uh, this is about as difficult as it gets. We're, we're faced with, I think everybody understands the, the issue with the Chesapeake and the, and the industry, and everyone's concerned about that, and the stock being so close to, you know, significant changes maybe in the not too distant future. So um, at that note, um, I think we're going to take a three minute caucus. You guys can talk, and we'll come back, and we'll call the vote. Okay, if everybody could grab their seats. We've had several requests for roll call votes, John Clark, so uh, <laughs> anyway, we'll, we'll be doing a roll call vote. So is everybody ready for the question? Okay, Max will call the roll. North to south with, starting with Maine? No. New Hampshire? No. Massachusetts? No. Rhode Island? No. Connecticut? No. New York? No. New Jersey? Yes. Pennsylvania? No. Delaware? Yes. 
Maryland? Yes. District of Columbia? Potomac River Fisheries Commission? Yes. Virginia? Yes. North Carolina? No. National Marine Fisheries Service? No. U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service? No. Motion fails, five in favor, 10 against, no null votes and no abstentions. Okay, we need to move on to the next item of business, which is the benchmark stock assessment terms of reference and Katie Drew is gonna do a, a presentation for us, Katie. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, just to refresh the, Schedule in everybody's mind. Um, I think Max touched on this briefly. So here's our benchmark um, assessment timeline. Uh, we've already had our data workshop planning call and webinar. Hopefully today we will have the um, board approval of the TORs, which gives us the framework to start moving forward with the assessment. We plan to spend the first year, um, so basically through 2017, working on developing the model with up data up through 2016. That'll give us time to test the model, test any new um, development or structure, uh, and have an assessment workshop at the end of this year to look at that. Um, then we plan to have another assessment workshop in the middle of next year, which will give us time to incorporate the new 2017 data into the assessment uh, so that we can go to peer review with the data through 2017 uh, sometime in early December so that the results will be available to the board uh, for review in February. So, and as I said, today we are going to hopefully approve these TORs. So basically, as you all know, the terms of reference for the stock assessment are a way to give us a framework and guidance to help us identify important issues that need to be considered as part of this assessment. But it's also important for us to kind of keep this a little bit flexible and open so that we are not bound to something that turns out it's gonna fail. The ASMFC external review process, which is what we're going through this time, uh, requires two sets of terms of reference, one for the stock assessment subcommittee to guide our model development process, and one for the reviewers to guide their review process. So I'm gonna go through these fairly quickly um, and try to highlight what the TC's intention is behind some of this language and in the hopes that it allays any concerns that the board has in terms of the development of this assessment. So uh, starting with the Stock Assessment Subcommittee set the terms of reference, uh, TOR 1 and 2 are really focused on the data. Uh, we used a lot of fairly standard language in this, so I'm going to try to focus on things that are new or special for striped bass. Um, but TOR 1 is just focused on investigating all of the sources of data, identifying strengths or weaknesses, um, and, and discussing how that impacts the assessment. So this includes the uh, fishery, independent and dependent data sets, life history, tagging data, um, indices of abundance, that sort of thing. TUR2 is focused on estimating the commercial and recreational landings and discards, um, ca including characterizing the uncertainty of the data and the spatial distribution of the fishery. Um, what's special for this assessment is, of course, we plan to have the new MRIP estimation uh, of striped bass uh, in this assessment as well as the calibration effort that's going on. So as you may or may not be aware, uh, MREP is, is going to update how they estimate effort uh, where they're transitioning from the telephone survey to a mail-based survey that has a better response rate, a better estimate of effort, but that is gonna change the estimates of total catch for a number of our species and we anticipate striped bass will be one of them. However, we plan to have those new estimates um, ready to go for the assessment so that the assessment can incorporate the best available science on that issue. Uh, the, stock has, the TOR3 is focused on the um, statistical catch at age model, and we are going to be trying to develop an estimate, an age-based model that can estimate um, annual fishing mortality, recruitment, total abundance, and spawning stock biomass um, for the time series as well as un estimate their uncertainty and perform the standard retrospective analyses 
but we also would like to be able to provide estimates of these quantities by stock component and sex where possible, as well as for the total stock complex. So by stock component, we're really talking about um, what we consider sort of the major producer stocks within the, the coastwide meta population, which includes the Chesapeake Bay stock, the Hudson River stock, the Delaware, and the Delaware Bay stock. Um, as well as looking at any new data that we have for the North Carolina component of this. Uh, I, we'd also like to do this by sex. However, we do include the where possible uh, caveat here because it's really going to depend on the quality of available data, not just for the most recent years, but for the entire time series. Uh, TOR4 is about the tagging model where we have an extensive set of tagging data uh, to estimate mortality and abundance, and we use that to really complement the work that's done through the statistical catch at age model. We've done a tremendous amount of work in the past trying to merge these two data streams together, and that has not really worked out for us, so they continue to be separate models. I think certainly we'll revisit that question, but for the now, um, they are separate models um, and sort of comp intended to complement each other, um, as well as we'd like to continue to provide suggestions for the further development of this data set and this model to make it more complementary and to help it support our management process better. Um, I'm sure this is the one that everybody's interested in. Uh, TOR 5 and 6 are focused on the biological reference points and the TACs. TOR5 is uh, update or redefine biological reference points, which include point estimates or proxies for BMSY, SSBMSY, FMSY, and MSY itself. Um, we currently use a proxy for, the, for these quantities, um, but this opens up the possibility of using these estimates themselves, using a different definition of a proxy. And we would define stock status based on these BRPs, again, by stock component where possible. Um, so we've kind of, we'll touch a little bit more on this on the next topic, but we know there's interest in the board in redefining these reference points, and that's definitely an important component of this stock assessment process. Um, we will be looking for you guys, to you guys for further guidance on what reference points to use, but I think uh, for the TORs, we want to keep it just vague and open at this point until we get better guidance from you guys. Uh, TOR6 is to provide annual projections of catch and biomass under alternative harvest scenarios. Um, so this is a pretty standard um, estimate and report annual probabilities of exceeding these threshold biological reference points um, for, for F and for SSB uh, to and under different harvest scenarios. And uh, TOR7 is just focused on future work, uh, review and evaluate the status of our research recommendations, come up with new research recommendations, and recommend the timing and the frequency of future assessment updates and the benchmark assessment process. So those are the um, TORs for the stock assessment subcommittee. For the peer review process, it's essentially the same wording, but instead they will focus on evaluating the data sets, evaluating the methods used to, uh, to estimate the commercial and recreational discards, evaluate the uncertainty in the new MRIP estimates of catch, um, evaluate the methods and models. Um, so there's really focusing on evaluating the work that we have done. Um, and again, evaluate the tagging model. Um, and this is, uh, so evaluate the choice of reference points and the methods that we use to estimate them, recommend the stock status determination based on what we present, or if appropriate, specify alternative methods or measures. And again, evaluate the annual projections of catch. Um, the, TO, the review panel will also um, provide research recommendations um, and recommend frequency of timing of the next benchmark assessment and then write their own report um, to be completed within four weeks of the workshop conclusion. So I'm going to pause here for questions about the TORs um, to make sure that I think this addresses people's concerns about the direction of the stock assessment um, and see if there's any edits that you guys want to make to those. Thanks, Katie. Uh, questions for Katie? John Clark. Uh, thank you, Katie, I, and you, maybe you'll go into this in the next part, but just when you were talking about the proxies, you said you're going to use a different definition of a proxy. Would you be explaining that more? Sure. At this point, um, with this TOR and at this point in the process, it's extremely open, whatever the future reference point will be. So right now we use the 95 value as the target or as the threshold and another value as the threshold. We could move those up or down as a proxy if we like the empirical based as opposed to a model based. But again, that's something we're looking, we're going to look to the board for guidance on, but that's what that is referring to. 
Robert Riley. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Katie. I have two questions. Um, you said it yourself how difficult it's been over time to um, juxtapose the tagging data um, with the model, whether it was VPA or now statistical catch at age. Is it really something else that could be done? Um, in other words, the tagging data might have applicability for TOR 2, maybe for some distributional aspects, but you know, the track record on the tagging data is, I mean, some really bright people working on the tagging subcommittee over the years, but never could get a corroborative uh, fix between the model and the tagging data. That's one question. The, the other question is very simple. Um, you mentioned in TOR 5 updating the biological reference points, and I assume part of that will be looking at natural mortality rate. So, um, yes, the getting the, I guess the first part of your question, getting the tagging data, um, it's always, I mean, it has always been supportive of the statistical catch at age model in terms of total mortality rates. So they're actually saying very similar things about the total mortality rate. And some of the disconnect comes between how you're handling natural mortality within that. Hopefully, um, we may be able to get some spatial information um, out of, or migration rates out of these data sets, but it's true that we, it's certainly not, this isn't the first time we've tried to answer this question. Um, I think it's still an important component of data that we need to evaluate for this process, but can we take the next step with it in terms of enhancing the statistical catch at age model? Um, it's unclear at this point, but we certainly want you know, that consideration to be on the table. Um, in terms of natural mortality, that would be part of the overall life history information going into both the model and the reference points coming out would be looking at natural mortality um, at age, potential changes over time, and things like that. Mike Louisi. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Katie. Um, I appreciate your your expansion of TOR3 as it related to uh, the producer areas, you know, something that we certainly have an interest in is the evaluation um, of the age-based model on, you know, we use the term resident stock, and resident stock would be those fish that have yet to become part of the migratory stock. And I just want to be clear in that as we proceed, the, we didn't use, you didn't use the word resident stock, but I'm assuming that it's those areas Chesapeake Bay, Delaware Bay, Hudson, where we have the young fish that have yet to become mature, and you'd be looking at when, when available, um, the model would be a, would be looking at exploitation of, of those residents, even without without using the word residents. Right. Obviously, I think you know the 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 issue that we've struggled with in, in, in trying to incorporate some spatial structure is really that em immigration and emigration rate. So uh, they do, as young ones, they're available in their natal bays and estuaries, and they move out at some point during their life to the coastal population where they become vulnerable to a different fishery. However, they also do return to those natal bays and estuaries to spawn where they're again vulnerable. So separating that, in, that kind of um, movement patterns out in the catch and in the, the biology is, is always the, the difficult part, and I think that's what's going to hold us back. But the intent would be to look at the, the numbers and the fishing mortality rates on that component of the larger coastwide meta population. So track them while they're in the bay and they're vulnerable to the bay fishery, track the ones that stay in and the ones that move out and join, join the coast and then are vulnerable to the, the coastal fishery. So understand, but un separating them out as these are fish that came out of the Chesapeake Bay and were subject to Chesapeake Bay mortality versus these are the ones that came out of the Hudson River and are separate, sub subject to the Hudson River mortality, um, I think is the, is what we're trying to go for with understanding kind of these complex stock dynamics within the the larger meta population of striped bass on the coast. Thanks, Katie. Uh, any other questions for Katie? Okay, we're going to need a motion on this because we. Oh, go ahead, Mike. Yeah, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Just one one last question. I wonder, Katie, if you can. Uh, you know, we talked a lot over the over the years of regarding the triggers that have. Um, put us in a position to have to take action. And if we're going to be considering new biological reference points, we're obviously going to need some evaluation or, or consideration of potential new triggers. And how those are related, I wonder, it, can you 
can you speak to whether or not that's something that needs to be done as a part of this benchmark, or would we have a follow-up action once, once the benchmark's complete and we have new reference points? You know, I think the board would be looking for technical advice as to how those triggers relate to um, the, new the, the new reference points. Yes, the TC did discuss this issue, and we decided we felt it was more appropriate to have that um, analysis and discussion after the benchmark was complete and the reference points have been selected by the board, be because there is a certain element of risk tolerance in that, so that we would like it to be more of a dialogue and a back and forth with the board in terms of if you select this reference point, um, here's a potential trigger, and here's the risk associated with it, and how much risk do you want to tolerate? What happens if you have a more conservative reference point versus is a less conservative reference point. And so I think we'd be happy to work with the board on developing more robust triggers or triggers that reflect the level of risk that you're willing to take. But it would probably be more efficient use of time to have that after the benchmark process and after we've decided on the reference points that we'd like to use going forward. Any other questions? Mike. More of a, a, a statement. Um, I've watched this board over the years, uh, from when I was technical to my career progression, and the board has never really decided what it wants this fishery to look like. And I bring this up as we talk about reference points, because MSY is a commercial reference point. It maximizes poundage from a fishery, which is not necessarily what you want from a recreational fishery. Uh, so I just thought I'd raise it. We, we, as we go along, we may not just want to say MSY is where we want to be and throw that out to the technical committee to consider because there are many other places we can go with that um, rather than pro forma go forward with what is recognized in fishery science as a commercial um, reference point. Okay, I thought I'd throw that out there. I have a whole set of slides on that that we'll get to in the next uh, agenda item, actually. So What a good segue. Segue, except for Mark Gibson wants to talk now, so we got to back up. Uh -oh. so. uh, no, given that uh, we're going to touch on what Mike just spoke to in the next agenda item, I'll wait till then. Okay, I need a motion, if it's the pleasure of the board, because we have to approve um, the, the tours. So okay. anybody want to offer one? John Clark. To approve the, move to approve the terms of reference. And we'll see, was there anything I have a else? second. Russ Allen. Any discussion on the motion? Is there any objection to the motion? Okay, seeing none, we'll adopt that as con unanimous consent. And now we can move on to uh, our next item. Now, um, Katie's going to do a presentation on this, and, and it really, I think, Mike, you did start off the conversation on this. This is kind of food for thought for the future, so we can have a little discussion on it, but really want to get the bigger discussion as we, we move forward. So, uh, Katie, take it away. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And so, basically, this is as our chair was saying, this is not a question that I want an answer to now, today. This is a, a question, but it is a qu answer that the TC is going to look to you guys for um, over the next couple of months as we begin work on this assessment, which is basically what types of biological reference points should we be pursuing. Um, in just as a, a quick review of the history of the assessment of reference points that we've used, um, from 2003 under Amendment 6, we had sort of a mishmash of FMSY-based reference points for um, the coast and the Chesapeake Bay, and then for F, and then empirical reference points related to the SSB threshold in 1995 as, um, the, as the SSB threshold and the SSB target as a value over that. Um, in Amendment in Addendum 4 to Amendment 6, we made those reference points line up better. So the problem was that the FMSY reference points, if you fished at them, would not get you to your target and threshold. So we made them line up and so that the rate that you're fishing at will get you to your target and your threshold SSB values um, given the recruitment history that we've seen in the past. And there were no reference points specifically for the Chesapeake Bay because the, the model already incorporated the Chesapeake Bay specific um, fishery performance within it. But the 2018 benchmark is going to give us an opportunity to really revisit these 
the management and fishery goals for this species, which I think is what we've been trying to get at through a lot of this discussion today. Um, the current biological reference points are based on historical performance, that when we put these into management, we were satisfied with the performance of the fishery in 1995, we were satisfied with what the stock looked like, and we wanted to keep it there um, at or above those levels going forward. And the question now is, is this still what the board wants? And what, or do we have different management goals at this point? Do we want to maximize yield, which as, as um, Mr. Armstrong was saying, is, is a historical, traditional reference point for a commercial fishery, is MSY. Do we want to maximize catch rates so that you can go out and have a high chance of catching a fish? Is that what we want? Do we want to maximize trophy size fish? Do we want regional reference points or do we want a coast-wide reference points? Do we want a less conservative threshold? Do we want that threshold to really represent a threshold that is a danger zone, or do we want to represent something different? Do we want ecosystem considerations to be in here? We've talked a lot about what's the effect of striped bass on other species? What's the effect of menhaden on striped bass? Are we going, ready to start linking some of these things up and consider the overall ecosystem considerations when we design a reference point? What we're planning to do is, is, so that's just a taste of some of the questions that we would like you guys to wrestle with over the next couple of months. What we would like to do is have the TC prepare a detailed memo on some of these options or some of these concepts to th sort of, I've kind of thrown out a bunch of stuff, um, but we'd like to sit down and prepare some background material and a detailed memo to give you guys before the summer meet meeting week. <coughs> and then put together a board workshop or a subcommittee to start hashing out some of these questions and decide what you want this fishery to look like, what you want this stock to look like, so that when we go forward and develop this assessment, we can develop reference points that reflect the management goals of this board. I know this is something we've tried in the past, um, and it's kind of gotten deadlocked in other things, but I think this is a great opportunity, especially um, given the concerns that have been raised with the reference points as they are now, to really reevaluate what we want out of this stock and out of this fishery. So as I said, we're not really looking for discussion or input now at this moment, but to give you guys time to start thinking about this, to, to think about your own um, state's needs and desires, and then to think about this in a larger context, in a more structured context at um, meeting week over the summer. Um, we do have plenty of time before this becomes critical, so hopefully it's not something that we need to do in a hurried fashion, but that's something that we can do um, with a lot of thought and consideration to really get at what do you want this fishery and this stock to look at. Thanks, Katie. So food for thought, and I'm not going to open it to questions, so I can gain some time, so, but I'm sure Katie will be around there. She's not going anywhere, so. Um, no promises. Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, uh, Katie. Uh, this sounds like a, a good idea uh, to go forward with. So do you need a, a consensus of the board to put that together? Um, do you need a motion, or are you just going to go forward pulling this all together? The latter. We're just going to, this is food for thought, so we'll, as next board meeting in August, we'll have a more detailed discussion on it, I'm sure. Okay, uh, that's the last agenda item we have other than other business. Is there any other business to come before the striped bass board? Seeing none, I think we're adjourned. We did that over email, I believe. So I'll okay. start the Menhaden board in about 10 minutes or so once we get everybody set.